So today we hear the voice of John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. He's calling to us down through the ages. But you know, his is not the only voice that we hear this morning. We also hear the voice of God speaking through Isaiah, saying, comfort my people. So how do we reconcile the voice of John calling us to repentance and the voice of God speaking these beautiful words of comfort? God's voice calls us to preach, to tell the truth of God's glory, to be heralds of the good tidings and indeed to reveal God's glory. The beginning of the gospel also speaks of the good news or the gospel of God. It's a message that God wants us to hear so much that he has sent prophets like Isaiah and Elijah and the herald John the Baptist, who represents here in Mark's gospel the reappearance of Elijah. And finally, of course, God's own son, Jesus. And this good news is that we are created and sustained by the God who loves us. And even though we have need of repentance, we are still loved. We're still called to be in relationship with the creator God. This is what the one crying out in the wilderness is trying to tell us, that we were made for relationship with God. But in order to be in that relationship, we have to face up to the truth of ourselves and not just in a kind of personal sense, but in a corporate whole of humanity kind of way too. This is the truth that God loves us, but that we, the human race, keep on choosing something other than that relationship. Mark tells us that before Jesus came on the scene, God sent his messenger, John the baptizer, to prepare his way. The way Mark describes him makes it very clear that he is Elijah, who is supposed to return. The very last words in the Old Testament from the prophet Malachi are, Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Isaiah in the passage we read today, in that beautiful passage that Paul read so beautifully, Isaiah calls us to get ready by preparing a way for the Lord, a highway in the desert. And what John the baptizer does in order to make a highway in the desert is to call people to repentance. He says, get ready for the one who's coming by examining yourself and then repenting. That's interesting, isn't it? He doesn't rush into Jerusalem with a band of people and try to overthrow the Romans in order to prepare for the kingdom of God. I think the reality is that overthrowing one bad regime wasn't and isn't going to cut it. When we, the goodies of the Western world, have vanquished ISIS or North Korea or Boko Haram or who are our current baddies, Sadly, that will not be the end of humanity's problems, will it? The problem is that we, humans of all races, keep choosing lies over truth. We keep choosing greed over equity, fear over love, darkness over light. Our human condition is that we choose power now over future glory. And that is what God, God's self, in the person of Jesus, came to change. God wants to comfort us. You know, in fact, I think it's probably because we keep making that choice that God wants to comfort us. God, since the dawn of time, and since, really, I suppose, the Garden of Eden, God has been asking us to choose. We can choose to live as people made in God's image, people who love instead of hating and fearing. We can choose to be people of generosity who share rather than people who choose to live as if we were in scarcity. We can be people of justice 
instead of people of injustice. We can be people whose hearts are the same as God's. But somehow, we keep on making wrong choices. The question is, why? And you know, the root problem seems to be our fear of mortality. When Isaiah is called by God to preach the truth, he objects. Isaiah says to God, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. To paraphrase, Isaiah says, God, I can't be bothered talking to them because they'll be dead in a minute. You made them mortal. That's their problem. We'll just get one lot sorted out and they'll die and we'll have to start on the next lot. Now, you can understand Isaiah's reluctance. This is how it is. Every generation in turn is marred by the constant fear of death. So they grab and they hurt and they destroy and they hate. But God's reply to Isaiah is to remind him of God's own eternal nature. Yes, humans' earthly lives are temporary, but God and God's word of truth are eternal. If we choose, we can share that eternity with God. And the news is good. God is coming and God will rule. It's going to be a very different world when God rules. And we humans can stop the constant seeking and searching because God will feed us and care for us. He will be gentle and tender with us. We are people made in God's image, so we have the potential for so much more. And that is the good news that Jesus brings, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can be different. We can act with compassion and generosity. We can be God's children, God's lambs. And you know as well, we can be God's hands and feet and do this for each other. John the baptizer calls us to repentance because one who is greater than he is on the way. Jesus, the bringer of holy fire, and that holy fire will change us and renew us and enable us. If Jesus' words to us last week were stay awake for the second coming, John's words to us this week are get ready, repent, be baptised, because our great God is coming in glory. Now, I, I have something that I'm troubled with. I think Stuart might suffer with it as well. I, I refer to it as my Messiah trouble. It's very bad today because this Isaiah passage is the text of the whole of the first section of Handel's Messiah. And I hear it echoing in my head. After you have the tenor, he sings, Comfort ye my people. And then you have, Every valley shall be exalted, and so on. And then all of a sudden, you've had that soloist. All of a sudden, the chorus breaks, and it's the altos <laughs> who started, and they sing, And the glory, the glory of the Lord. And everybody else sings, And the glory, the glory of the Lord and so on. And, you know, it's so glorious at that moment that you almost don't need the rest. Of course, the narrative goes on and we hear about the Messiah's suffering and death and the glorious resurrection and then we have the Alleluia Chorus, and, which is only the end of part two. There's still quite a lot to go, isn't there? Um, but in this first moment all of God's glory is revealed. And you know, that is the story of the incarnation. In the incarnation, in the birth of Mary's baby, God chose to dwell with us and to pack his glory into a tiny human form. God chose to live with the world as it was, as it is, full of sin and brokenness, as well, of course, as my, of moments of joy and love and wonder. 
The fact that there has been an incarnation, that God is God with us, Emmanuel, God imminent and imminent, means that we have moved into the next phase. We are part of God's glory now. But it's as if we have a hangover and we can't quite shake off the fear that makes us limited people. So this week, that's my challenge. Let us both be readying ourselves by repenting the things that make us selfish or perhaps just things that make us indifferent and let us speak truth to our world. For we are all called to prophesy, you know. We're, we're all called to be prophets in our world. Not fortune tellers or forecasters or even doomsday prognosticators. What we are called to is to be truth tellers. And the truth that we must tell is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of the kingdom of God. We need to comfort God's people, to feed his flock. We need to tell others that they are loved and valued by God. We need to show others that they are loved and valued by God. And so to borrow from St Francis, let me say to you, go into the world and preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.